Welcome and thank you all for standing by. At this time, I would like to inform all participants that your lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. Today's call is also being recorded. If you do have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And I will now turn the call over to Ms. Abby Capabianco. Thank you. You may begin. Hello, and welcome to this media briefing to discuss the SBA's authorization of changes to simplify the use of the bivalent mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. I'm Abby Capobianco with the SBA's Office of Media Affairs. Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the SBA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, will provide brief remarks before answering questions. After the remarks, we will then move to the question and answer portion of the call. Reporters on the phone will be in a listen-only mode until we open the call for questions. As a reminder, this audio call is being recorded and live streamed on the FDA's YouTube channel. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. Also, please ensure questions pertain to today's announcement only and limit yourself to one question so we can get to as many questions as possible. With that, I will now turn the call over to Dr. Marks. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, hello, and thank you for joining us today. Um, today, to better facilitate the use of vaccination and helping to prevent the potential serious complications of COVID-19, the FDA has amended the emergency use authorizations, or EUAs, for the Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 bivalent vaccines. These changes simplify the vaccination schedule for most individuals and authorize the current bivalent vaccine to be used for all doses administered to individuals six months of age or older, uh, including an additional dose or doses for certain populations. At this stage of the pandemic, the best available data show that most of the U.S. population five years of age and older have antibodies to sars coronavirus 2 the virus that causes COVID-19, as a result of either vaccination or having been infected with the virus. These data support simplifying the use of the authorized bivalent mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, and the agency believes that this approach will help us achieve higher vaccination coverage across the country. I'll now give you a quick overview of what these changes mean for different populations. Most individuals, depending on age, previously vaccinated with an original or monovalent COVID-19 vaccine who have not yet received a dose of a bivalent vaccine may receive a single dose of a bivalent vaccine. Most unvaccinated individuals uh, may receive a single dose of a bivalent vaccine rather than multiple doses of the original monovalent RNA vaccine. Those are individuals who have never received a COVID-19 vaccine. And most individuals who have already received a single dose of the bivalent vaccine are not currently eligible for another dose. The FDA intends to make decisions about future vaccination for all the various populations after receiving recommendations on the fall strain composition at an FDA advisory committee meeting to be held in June. However, individuals 65 years of age and older who have received a single dose of a bivalent vaccine may receive one additional dose of vaccine at least four months following their initial bivalent dose. Additionally, most individuals with certain kinds of immunocompromise who have received a bivalent COVID-19 vaccine may receive a single additional dose of a bivalent COVID-19 vaccine at least two months following a dose of a bivalent COVID-19 vaccine and additional doses may be administered at the discretion of and at intervals determined by their health care provider. However, for immunocompromised individuals six months through four years of age, eligibility for additional doses will depend on the vaccine previously received. Children six months through five years of age who are unvaccinated may receive a two-dose series of the Moderna bivalent vaccine and children six months through four years of age may receive a three-dose series of the Pfizer-BioNTech bivalent vaccine. And children five years of age may receive either two doses of the Moderna bivalent vaccine or a single dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech bivalent vaccine. Children six months through five years of age who receive one, two, or three doses of a monovalent COVID-19 vaccine may receive a bivalent vaccine but the number of doses that they receive will depend on the vaccine and their vaccination history. 
COVID-19 continues to be a very real risk for many people. We are therefore encouraging everyone to consider staying current with vaccination, including with a bivalent COVID-19 vaccine. And today's actions aim to simplify the vaccination process and make it more understandable. Uh, the available data continue to demonstrate that vaccines prevent the most serious outcomes of COVID-19, including hospitalization and death. And with that, I'll turn the call back over to Abby. Thank you, Dr. Mark. At this time, we will begin the question and answer portion of the press conference. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. When asking a question, please state your name and affiliation. Also, please ensure questions pertain to today's announcement and limit yourself to one question so we can get to as many questions as possible. Operator will take the first question. Thank you. And at this time, if you would like to ask a question over the phone, please ensure that your phone is unmuted, press star one, and record your name clearly when prompted. If you would need to withdraw your question, you may press star two. Again, to ask a question, that is star one. One moment. Our first question is from Helen Branswell with STAT. You may go ahead. Um, thanks very much for taking my question. Um, today's announcement talks about effectively removing the monovalent vaccines, making the bivalent vaccines the standard. Um, what happens to the BLAs for the monovalents? Because the only uh, uh, vaccine, COVID vaccines that have BLAs are the, the Pfizer and Moderna monovalents. And does it become difficult to issue uh, BLAs for the, COVID, uh, for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, the, bi the bivalents, excuse me, because the amount of antigen in those vaccines is different from the amount of antigen that was tested in the original studies. Thank you. No, thanks very much for that question. So um, those uh, BLAs will stay in place. Um, uh, this happens not infrequently in other situations, uh, with uh, influenza, uh, when there's a period where there is not a vaccine that's actively being administered, uh, even though um, uh, the uh, the BLAs are open, um, what uh, what we need, in fact, in in many ways, we'd like to have them remain in place because they will be the subject, likely, um, of manufacturer supplements in the future, uh, uh, where uh, they will then update. Uh, the vaccine composition. And uh, actually, I think we see a reasonably straightforward way uh, that that will uh, happen moving forward uh, uh, as, uh, as the vaccines um, uh, essentially move into uh, the next uh, strain selection uh, uh, after uh, June. Thank you. And next we have David Lim Operator with Politico. Thank you. I apologize. Next we have David Lim with Politico. You may go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, the updated guidelines state it's up to individual health care providers to determine the interval at which immunocompromised individuals can be administered additional boosters. Is there an interval at which the FDA believes doctors should adhere to for this population, or are you looking to ASIP to provide more concrete guidance for doctors at tomorrow's meeting? So uh, it's a great question. The issue of the immunocompromised is that there is such a variety uh, uh, of conditions, including people who are uh, immunocompromised enough that they need uh, one additional dose or so immunocompromised because their immune systems have been uh, perhaps uh, uh, wiped out by a stem cell transplant uh, that they almost need uh, uh, their immune systems to be fully re-educated. And so by leaving this open uh, to uh, recommendations potentially from ACIP um, uh, or to uh, societies that care for uh, transplant patients, et cetera, um, we will uh, hopefully uh, allow uh, individualization of uh, the vaccination uh, as appropriate for the degree of immunocompromise uh, in different individuals. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. 
The next question is from Eben Brown with Fox News. You may go ahead. Good morning, uh, Dr. Marx. Thank you so much for doing this. A question about the current bivalent uh, vaccines. Uh, for how much longer will you uh, would you think that they will be effective? And w what is the uh, uh, future plans here for updating the vaccine formula? Uh, for instance, you know the the flu shot we get uh, every year is different based on uh, emerging uh, strains and whatnot. When when do we move into a model with that with the with the COVID vaccines? Yeah, great question. So I I indeed, we are uh, moving right into that model as we speak. So right now, the bivalent vaccines. Um, uh, appear to uh, help uh, uh, prevent the current uh, XBB uh, 1.5 variants uh, that are circulating um, uh, uh, from causing uh, uh, severe disease. I think that's important. Um, and what will happen is as we come into June, uh, we will uh, be looking at all of the different circulating uh, variants. As you may be aware, there are uh, two uh, new variants that are being watched closely, um, uh, uh, one Hyperion, the other Arcturus, otherwise known by XBB 1.9.1 uh, uh, and XBB 1.16. Uh, and uh, we'll be looking closely at those um, uh, uh, to see uh, what's going on. It turns out that right now, um, since those, the, the same spike protein um, is present um, on XBB 1.5 and those other variants to a large extent, um, we think that we it, it may be it may turn out that as we go to select, uh, we'll be able to find something that um, is able to cover them all. But that will be a, the topic of the discussion uh, in June. I think this is going to look, as you've implied, very much start to look very much like uh, what we do for influenza. And I'll acknowledge that it's true, um, COVID. 19 is not influenza. <laughs> uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 is not the influenza virus. Uh, but th that said, um, we're using that public health model uh, where um, we'll look to do our best to select what we believe to be uh, likely to circulate uh, the following uh, uh, fall winter season uh, and uh, use that in the vaccine composition. Um, so to try to protect as many people uh, during the season in which respiratory viruses tend to uh, wreak their havoc, which is uh, fall to winter uh, uh, months uh, of the year. Thank you. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Mike Ehrman with Reuters. You may go ahead. Hi, thank you. Two two quick questions. The CDC work group said in February that they felt the data was uh, insufficient to recommend more than one booster a year for older and in immunocompromised people. Does, does FDA agree with that conclusion? Is there newer data you're considering? And also on the uh, the June uh, variant mix meeting, is FDA confident that that time frame gives Novavax enough time to manufacture a protein-based vaccine for the fall? Or will there be any chance there will be earlier discussion for Novavax? Dr. Mark? One moment. We may have lost the speaker. One moment. It does look like uh, Dr. Marks has disconnected. We'll just be one moment while we wait for him to reconnect. Please continue to stand by. Thank you.
And please continue to stand by. We will have Dr. Marks back shortly. Hello. And Dr. Marks, your line is back open. You may proceed. Thank you. Um, I, I believe uh, the, the last question was about uh, whether the uh, June uh, advisory committee timeframe was uh, enough time to consider Novavax. Um, is that correct? There were, there were two questions. Is it that, that one and also whether, uh, you know, CDC workgroup said in February data was insufficient to recommend more than one booster a year. Is there, is there new data or does, does FDA disagree with that conclusion? No, I, I think for, for those, so let's start with that one. For, for individuals uh, 65 years and over, um, at, at this point, barring the development of a radically new uh, 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 SARS coronavirus 2 variant, um, the modeling data and the data that we have suggests that uh, about a six month interval uh, is reasonable at this time. So I think we are in agreement there. That's the reason for uh, allowing uh, one additional. A bivalent dose in individuals 65 and over. Uh, and uh, re regarding uh, Novavax, um, we intend to have the discussions uh, and work with the companies. Uh, uh, first of all, there will be an open public discussion in, uh, in, in June, uh, but we'll be working with all of the different companies to try to make sure that um, we have uh, the appropriate vaccines uh, available timely uh, for the fall, uh, and uh, that's uh, something that's an ongoing uh, piece of work. Thank you. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Alexander Tin with CBS. You may go ahead. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, can you clarify who you have in mind for additional boosters out of that June meeting? Are we talking about all ages or specific groups? And then separately following up on Mike Ehrman's question, can you clarify why it took longer for FDA to authorize these additional boosters for seniors compared to some of their peers abroad? Give us an example of what you were waiting for. Thanks. Great, so um, the, the, the meeting in June will be essentially a decision looking at the various circulating strains uh, and making a decision for the entire population and what we do uh, in uh, the fall. In fact, this particular action is essentially preparatory uh, to trying to have a simpler, more straightforward way of going about vaccinating people with, uh, uh, to protect them against uh, COVID-19. The idea here is now we're basically, it's gonna be simple. It's a, a essentially a single dose of uh, the appropriate strain vaccine as we move into the fall and winter months and hopefully, uh, by analogy to what we do for influenza, uh, people will uh, find that something that's understandable uh, and uh, that they can accept, uh, especially as our immunity uh, starts to wane uh, even further against uh, the various uh, COVID-19 variants. So um, I, that, that is the, the, the discussion that will occur in, in June will be for the overall population. And it took us a little longer to get to where we were uh, now because this was a very major action of consolidation here uh, where we moved to uh, a, a single uh, vaccine composition uh, for uh, everyone. Uh, uh, we also wanted to make sure that we felt very comfortable um, with the data supporting uh, the second dose of the bivalent uh, boosters for those who we have uh, authorized it, and I, I think uh, that time gave us uh, a, a good chance to look at data, some of which has only very recently come out um, uh, in public, uh, to uh, be able to feel comfortable um, that, uh, uh, that this is a, a, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, so again, large action, but hopefully setting us up uh, for success, uh, because if anything comes out of uh, this action, we're hoping uh, that it can encourage people uh, who have not received a bivalent booster uh, to go out and consider getting one, because even in the uh, most significant target population of individuals 65 and older, um, uh, CDC recently reported that only 42% of eligible people have gotten a bivalent booster. Um, so we'd like them to know that it's a good idea to 
uh, do that now uh, and, uh, uh, and hopefully set us up for success as we move into uh, fall and winter uh, for people to have uh, a better understanding uh, of the potential benefit that these uh, vaccines can bring. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Danny L. Farouk with Regulatory Focus. You may go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Marks. Uh, I wanted to kind of talk about uh, the fact that you're uh, still relying um, significantly on the monovalent vaccine um, uh, studies. Uh, could you kind of talk about whether at some point you are only going to be using bivalent vaccine uh, data to make future decisions? And two, um, when you're talking about the processes uh, that you're trusting because the processes in the past have worked, um, how much of that is reliant on animal studies? So, great question. Um, right now, we're using essentially hybrid data, um, uh, data uh, from the monovalent combined with data uh, that we're getting uh, from bivalent. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think what we've seen um, is that uh, although obviously uh, effectiveness data has to be with the specific vaccine, that by and large, um, uh, what we see with monovalents are uh, against a given uh, a set of COVID-19 variants or SARS coronavirus 2 variants. Um, uh, and uh, what we see with the bivalent uh, vaccines, they're analogous to one another. So I think we're comfortable uh, making some extrapolations here uh, based on our understanding uh, of these vaccines, given the hundreds of millions of doses given and given what we've seen with um, uh, real world evidence both with the monovalent and the bivalent uh, vaccines now. Um, but it is, it is kind of a hybrid uh, that we're working with. Uh, ultimately, um, we'll have data um, uh, essentially for additional data for the uh, bivalent. Um, but that doesn't mean we will leave the monovalent data behind entirely. I think that, that it's useful uh, to help us understand some of, these, uh, some of the pr properties of these vaccines as well. So, um, again, we'll, we'll probably we'll use, leverage all the data at hand here um, as we move forward. Um, your point, just to, so I don't forget, your point about animal studies, um, animal studies may be important as we move into uh, uh, new uh, variants in the event that we don't have clinical data from humans uh, and we need to make a strain change. We're not sure whether that's going to be the case this year or not yet, um, uh, but um, uh, we would obviously always try to re rely on the most robust data, which would be if we have data, it would be data from humans, and we'll only uh, drop back, fall back to uh, using animal data um, if we uh, need to uh, based on uh, what uh, emerges. This is all because this particular virus seems to be able to evolve very rapidly, and we need to do whatever we can uh, to keep up uh, and do our best to protect the population. Thank you. Operator, we'll take the next question. Thank you. Our next question is from Dennis Thompson with Health Day. You may go ahead. I think you've already touched on this, but just, just to make sure I, I heard right, what proportion of Americans under 65 won't need another booster at this time because they're up on their vaccinations? And what's the likelihood that those healthy Americans won't need another booster going forward? Uh, no, that's actually a great question, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked it. Um, uh, it, it. It turns out that uh, uh, um, Americans under 65 um, have not taken advantage of getting a bivalent a booster by large, uh, to a large extent. And so uh, the large majority, uh, in fact, uh, uh, probably uh, close to 75 or so percent, uh, roughly, uh, are eligible under 65, uh, th those individuals between ages uh, 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 12 and 65 um, uh, could be getting a bivalent booster at this point um, and have not, uh, uh, have not uh, taken one. Uh, uh, so those those individuals uh, certainly um, uh, could go out and get a bivalent booster now to improve their uh, protection. Um, 
obviously you've probably heard controversy about this, but that would that that is a uh, has been a recommendation uh, for staying up to date. Um, uh, we do think that as we move into future seasons, particularly um, if the uh, strain uh, com composition of the vaccine has to be updated, that it may be important for all individuals uh, to get uh, an updated vaccine in order to provide uh, protection here uh, against uh, future, uh, uh, future variants that come along. Uh, ultimately, the goal here is to prevent the worst outcomes from COVID-19, which are, uh, you know, hospitalization and deaths. But, um, you know, the influenza model also tries to reduce other uh, uh, issues that go along with, uh, with uh, these viruses, which include healthcare utilization, um, uh, uh, particularly during winter months uh, when uh, the healthcare system is taxed by having multiple respiratory viruses circulating. Um, and particularly, obviously, now we're concerned about the three that uh, appear this year all on top of each other, um, uh, uh, influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, and um, uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 virus to cause disease. Operator, we'll take the next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Sarah Carlin-Smith with Pink Sheet. You may go ahead. Hi. Um, you, you guys mentioned the upcoming June meeting. Um, you, um, Dr. Marks, you talked before about, you know, perhaps needing to look to next generation vaccines um, beyond this fall. Is there going to be any talk or thought as to from the advisory meeting about kind of, how, of what approaches we should be looking at? And then um, is there any um, amount of money that the White House said last week they're going to be putting $5 billion towards next-gen vaccines? Is any of that going to the FDA or what role or say will FDA have in kind of how that money gets spent or what might get, you know, prioritized there? Yeah, so, so let me just kind of uh, walk that back just a bit to say that, you know, as we come into this, this advisory committee meeting in June, we'll discuss kind of the cadence of future vaccination. So that'll be a, 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 a discussion of uh, using our existing vaccines um, uh, or updated vaccines based on strain composition, um, what the recommendation should be. So um, they, I, I should, I should be clear that the recommendation currently, we don't have a. It's not like we have an annual recommendation yet. The uh, right now we have a recommendation for a uh, a single uh, vaccine with the bivalent, um, but that will be discussed. That recommendation of what to do for future years um, will be discussed uh, at the advisory committee. Um, uh, is it possible? Uh, that uh, this will be something that will happen on a regular basis. It is, but that's something for discussion uh, at the advisory committee. As for uh, newer uh, generations of vaccines, um, I think, although they may be touched upon, I think these are going to be discussed in other venues. Um, and we're obviously very interested uh, in helping to facilitate the development. Uh, and I can't speak to... <laughs> I, I can't speak to anything about the funding right now because I'm just not, I don't have that knowledge right now. Operator, we have time for one last question. Thank you. Our last question is from Paul Slosher with Endpoint News. You may go ahead. On uh, the uh, uh, emergency use authorizations, how long after the uh, pandemic declarations expire that the FDA can uh, keep use, uh, issuing these? emergency use authorizations. Right. So um, the, 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 there are two uh, separate pieces to the emergency use um, uh, authorizations here. There's the declaration uh, that will end, that we're all aware will end in uh, uh, about a month um, uh, it, or, or less. Um, and uh, that uh, is uh, for a, a variety of things. Um, uh, but it does not uh, prevent us. When that ends, we have a different declaration. Um, it's our 
uh, 550, uh, sorry, 564 uh, uh, declaration, uh, which allows us to continue uh, to use uh, these vaccines and to make them available and other medical products um, uh, because uh, of the potential for uh, the public health uh, emergency. Uh, that will continue uh, for the time being, um, and uh, it can continue for uh, uh, as long as we need to while that uh, potential uh, threat exists. So um, the hope, obviously, is to start to transition all of these products uh, into uh, uh, licensed products. And obviously, we're working actively with the various sponsors uh, to get there because um, we would uh, obviously prefer to have these move uh, to that pathway. Um, I think uh, we know that people feel more comfortable um, uh, overall with licensed products, um, despite the fact that these emergency use authorized products um, have, uh, are, are, you know, we, we stand behind their uh, safety, effectiveness, and quality just the same way we do uh, the licensed products, but we will help uh, get there. Um, uh, I, I can't give you the exact timing uh, when all of that will happen and when uh, these uh, 564 uh, declaration will go away, in part because I don't have a crystal ball and I'm not able to tell when uh, some of the uh, potential challenges of uh, coronavirus will go away. This concludes today's FDA media briefing. A replay will be available on the FDA's YouTube page. If you have follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact the FDA press office at fdaoma at fda.hhs.gov. Thanks and have a great day.